Veronica and camcorder, the Sony FS5 versus the Cinema Line camera, Sony FX30. Which one of these is actually worth investing into today? Because after using these for a little bit, I realized how capable is the FS5 and how it isn't one to be overlooked. However, in the light of the latest FX30, it may be considered if anyone should bother with a camera like the FS5 anymore, no matter how capable it is. In this video, I'm comparing these two cameras with image quality, ergonomics, and my limited personal user experience with these guys. You see, I was looking for a more video-centric camera. As someone who makes regular YouTube videos and also helps with the audiovisual department at my local church, these two cameras seem to suit me best as a Sony user. Instead of getting the FS5's today's price of $4,249.99, I got it for $1,500 from eBay, which falls in a similar price bracket as the FX30, which comes in at almost $1,800 for the body alone and $2,100 with the XLR handle. I got the FS5 thinking it would be the studio camera I'd set and forget over here, and the FX30 would be the everything else camera for B-roll, gimbal work, or even photography. However, this is not the setup that would work for me, but more on that later on. When it comes to image quality, the FS5 is better than the FX30 in detail. Although both are Super 35 sensors, the differences are evident mostly in the differences in 1080 footage, as you notice the softness in the FX30's 1080. If color bit rates matter to you, you'll side with the FX30 as it can go up to 4K 10 bit, whereas the 4K in the FS5 only goes up to 8 bit. But if you're not color grading heavily, then you'll be fine with 8 bit footage on your FS5 or at least upscale your 1080 10-bit footage. Yes, both of these cameras can output ProRes RAW externally through an Atomos monitor, but a unique feature that separates these two is Cine EI. This allows for cleaner shadows like in other cinema cameras like the Sony FX3, FX6, and FX9. You won't find this in any of the cameras from Sony, like their Sony A7S III or their A7R4, 5, A1, both of these cameras provide slow motion through S and Q mode and higher frame rates. Higher frame rates on the FS5 like 4K60 and 4K120 require an Atomos setup, but aside from that, one of the most unique features out of the FS5, which is actually favorable over the FX30, is the ability to capture slow motion after hitting the record button, as it does a couple seconds of pre-recording and stops when you hit the record button. This is favorable for wildlife shooters who want to save on battery, memory card space, and time, as you only need a few seconds to capture. This also works well for sports if seconds are sufficient for you. Next important thing to consider with any camera is of course the glass. Fortunately, both of these cameras share the use of E-mount lenses, especially since both of these cameras are Super 35 and can utilize the clear image zoom with their respective zoom rockers. However, the autofocus in the FX30 is far superior to the one in the FS5 for this phase-based autofocus, which is why as a solo content creator, I shake my head at the FS5 for not being able to be reliable enough for me as my studio camera. I can't wave my hands in front of the camera and bring objects in front of the camera without much hunting going on. The FS5 had trouble maintaining focus on me as I was moving my hands during a tutorial, yet the FX30, no matter what I do, always maintained focus on me and focus on products in my hand if I put it in front of my face. For external operation, consider how you'll carry your camera. The FS5 top handle has two mounting points and is much sturdier than the one for the FX30. Some FX30 users have reported breaking these top handles and have resorted to using third-party top handles instead. If having multiple audio solutions is important to you, consider how the FX30 has XLR inputs limited in the top handle, whereas the FS5 has one XLR input in the handle and one in the body. There is a microphone jack though on the body of the FX30 and its top handle, but there's no 3.5mm microphone jack anywhere on the FS5. Both have a headphone jack in the body to monitor audio. In terms of body stabilization, the FX30 has an advantage with its IBIS. But even without it, the FS5 still has a big win with its internal ND. For me, I thought I wanted IBIS on all of my cameras. But after using the internal NDs, oh man, what a pleasure. I don't mind giving up in body image stabilization. One of the things that I love about both of these cameras is the video-centric button layouts. I used to think that I loved the Sony Alpha full-frame bodies like the a7 III and the Sony a7S III. But when I started using these cameras, I realized that I was video first and photo second. It's such a convenience to have way more video dedicated buttons and switches versus having to dig through the menus for the most used settings like white balance, peaking, zebras, audio control, and just being able to have access to multiple record buttons. For the FS5, it's all on the left hand side, but for the FX30, you're pretty much gonna have to use the function menu and touchscreen in tandem to achieve a similar experience. 
by the way, the FS5 adjustable side handle with additional custom buttons and spinning dial. It's just so nice. Interestingly enough, although the FS5 isn't marketed as a cinema camera, it allows you to expose with shutter angle. While the FX30 is marketed as a cinema camera, it is stuck on shutter speed with no option to use shutter angle and no waveform. If you plan on being adventurous with either of these cameras, just know that although you'll be most likely good with the FX30's weather ceiling, you'll need your own cover for the FS5 which promises no ceiling whatsoever. This is not professional advice, but the most ill weather I'd bring my FX30 in is some light snow and some light rain. When not in extreme weather conditions, the FS5 is still a workhorse for everyday projects, as many people are still using it alongside Atmos monitor recorders and outputting it progress for faster and easier workflows. For its most minimal yet functional kit, you can add a 5 inch monitor and switch out the included BPU battery with a bigger one. Whereas with the FX30, you'd have to rely on a 5 inch monitor, some kind of battery bank workaround for more power, or mount it on a rail with a bigger battery. Yes, the overall FS5 form factor is clearly bigger than the FX30 with the top handle, but it's justified and functional. It pretty much has everything already to make filming easier. If you want to save your back, the FX30 with the top handle is attractive with its light footprint, but you have to keep in mind the battery life if you have long day shoots. This camera is absolutely an easy recommend for anyone today, for production from solo content creators to professionals looking for a reliable B camera or even A camera. The FS5 can still pull its weight amongst today's newer camera technology if you contemplate on getting one. But depending on the kind of production needs you have, you're better off saving for an FX6 as it nearly has everything and does everything as the FS5 does, but better. If you can't choose, well then I guess you just have to get both. But please don't buy the FS5 Mark 1 before watching this review because it may not be worth it after all. <laughs>